when um, Tom put the plastic on the windows a couple of weeks ago, it robbed me of one of the great joys of Sunday morning. Um, St. Mary's, uh, y'all yeah, know this, this isn't a surprise. Uh, 10 o'clock is a guideline for starting. Um, you know, and I got to tell you, sometimes uh, at 5 to 10, it's like, uh, did I get the payroll or something? But anyway, what, what's a, a delight is to watch your cars come in. Um, sometimes you buy a new car and you confuse me because I don't recognize your vehicle. Uh, but generally speaking, I recognize your vehicles. Uh, and then you start walking up the aisle and, and I recognize you. But since Tom put the plastic, which was a good service to the community, I, I, I can't recognize you anymore. Um, except, you're not going to believe this, Winston, you're not going to believe this. When you walked up the walk before, I did not recognize you. I can't even see faces, right? But believe it or not, I recognized your walk. And I said, to him, is, 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 that, is that Mr. Fraser? And then I was thinking, why are we here? Oh, he's related to people, you know, and all the rest of that. So believe it or not, I recognized your walk. We've known each other for how long? It must be 30 years or something. It was a way, way back. 75? 75? 75 years or 1975? Something like that anyway. But yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, we, we recognize each other by, by, by various things. I wish my sermon this morning was about, you know, God recognizing us and, you know, God having his big grip. But it's not. It's a follow-up to last week. But I'm going to use this sometime in the, in, in, in the sermon. Um, for those of you that have missed a couple of weeks, uh, I'm on to a series of three Ds. Uh, discipleship, discipline, and daring. And um, I've, I've explained some of the rationale for, for, for these sermons and where I'm going with it uh, down the road a little bit. Um, I'm not going to you know, use up time doing that because otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll go over my time. Um, but what I want to cover this morning, uh, or what I want to deal with this morning, is daring as it relates to the Christian life. And I got, I got to say, when I was putting this together, I needed three Ds. Discipleship wasn't a problem. Uh, discipline, that wasn't a problem. But what, what D word corresponds with the challenge to step out in faith when you don't know what's ahead of you when you take that next step? And uh, I bet a lot, a lot of you have seen the Indiana, the Indiana Jones movie where he's on one side and he has to get to the other side and the bridge is invisible and it's only as you take the step that the planks of the bridge become obvious, right? Uh, I think they would have, I think they should have not had a bridge. I think they should have had a walking on air and let everybody guess. But you know, sometimes Christian life is like this. So what, what word do you use to describe that? And the word I came up with was daring. But I've got to tell you, I'm not, I'm not completely happy with daring. Um, for example, uh, when we use the word dare or daring, it's like, how dare you? Uh, and, and I'm not sure that that sort of corresponds with what I'm, I'm getting at uh, in, in the sermon. Like, how dare you? Well, I dare because I want to, whatever the how dare you thing is. Uh, risk taking. Uh, some risk taking is wise, some risk taking is appropriate, some risk taking is simply foolish. So daring and risk taking, well, you can't really equate that. Uh, some daring is really stupidity. Uh, I remember one time when I did something, and this is way in my youth, um, that uh, it, it's, it's kind of weird to, you know, people walk around the scooter and stuff to think back on this. Um, when I began to ski, uh, this is a lot of years ago, uh, in the days when you had like really long skis, anyone old enough to remember the really long skis? I had good skis, uh, but they were really long skis. Um, and there's a place in Montreal behind the uh, University of Montreal, uh, where they used to have ski jump. Uh, I decided it would be kind of fun having watched Wide World of Sports. And how hard could it be, you know, to go ski jumping? Hard. Uh, it wasn't that big a jump, and I uh, obviously lived to tell the tale. That wasn't daring, that was stupid. Okay, so daring and stupid are to be equated. So what, what really is daring, and, and how does daring relate to Christianity? Okay, so I chose D, daring as my, as my, as my D, um, but really what, what is it? Um, what I want to get at is that there is a degree of risk involved when we step out in faith. And so obviously, no, maybe not obviously, but what I need to do before talking about that degree of risk in stepping out in faith, I need to talk a little bit about what faith is. And in, 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 in our society, and sometimes I believe even in the church, um, what we try to do, we try to domesticate faith. And we try to 
not only domesticate the word, but domesticate faith itself. And we try, while hanging on to the word, because it's all holy to talk about faith and stuff like that, what we try to do is turn faith into something akin to empirical knowledge. You know, empirical knowledge being facts that we can be certain of. For example, to say I have faith that the sun is going to rise tomorrow is not an appropriate use of the word faith. That's not what faith is about at all. Um, the sun has, well, the sun doesn't rise, the earth spins, but given that, um, you know, all our lives, you wake up in the morning, the sun's risen, you know. Uh, we understand the mechanics of all this. We understand the degree of celestial mechanics. So if we were to wake up tomorrow and the sun wasn't to rise, uh, we would think, we, I was going to say we think we're in Iowa, but anyway, uh, we would think that you know, something weird had happened to the laws of the universe. Um, so it's not really faith. I don't really have faith that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. It's knowledge of celestial mechanics, which is just a fancy way of saying it's what the sun's done ever since I was born. Um, other misuses of the word faith. We talk about, you know, having faith in a politician. Uh, well, maybe we don't talk about having a faith, faith in a politician. Uh, but we have faith in some authority figures. Uh, we have faith in some management systems. So we use the word faith somewhat loosely. Um, for Christianity, uh, for people of faith, the word has a specific definition. Um, in order to get that definition, I got to talk about the word belief, because the word belief and the word faith are often used interchangeably, but they mean something different. The word believe means to behave in a certain way based on your experience. So, one of the uh, images that I've, I've used in the past is when I got my first bank card. Um, this is the mid-90s, you know, and I was asked by my bank then, did I want a bank card to go to, you, you know, use the ATM? Uh, ATMs were new, and the idea of having a bank card or a card that you could put into a machine and get out money, etc., 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 do other banking things. I don't know if you recall how you felt when you first started doing that. To me, it was weird because my banking experience always had been going into a bank, uh, lining up, sometimes for far too long, um, meeting with a person who sometimes knew far too little, uh, and doing my banking like that. And I'm old enough that I remember a bank book being handwritten, you know, the deposit being handwritten as opposed to being put in the machine. So that's my experience. Now all of a sudden you're telling me to put this piece of plastic in the machine and it is going to take care of my finances. Well, while I understood a little bit about how these mechanical things work and a little bit had been explained to me about the procedures and process and how to get into it, I was skittish, you know, the first few times I did that. But over a period of time, my experience of it was that not only did it work, but it was really handy and convenient. And perhaps I am rare here, but I have never picked up a mistake made by the machine. Uh, humans make mistakes, machines don't, should I say that? Um, and so over, the, over a period of time, I began to believe in it, because my experience was such that I could trust it and could rely on it. So I would behave in a certain way based on my experience. Uh, I became a fan of bank cards. And in fact, in the early days when not everybody had a bank card, um, I was quite an advocate for it because the convenience of it was really fantastic. So I began to behave in a certain way based on my experience. I began to believe in that system. Uh, the other illustration that I use, and for some of you this might be a reminder that you go, oh yeah, or why did you have to do that one again? Um, cars. I will tell you point blank. I believe in Mazda. Uh, I believe in Toyota. I do not believe in Ford. I have had one Ford in my life. Now, if any of you are fans of Ford, uh, this is the apology part of the sermon. You can talk to me after, uh, whatever. Uh, I have had one Ford. And that is it. Um, I will gladly share all of my experiences of my Ford with you at a particular time of your choosing. 
uh, with a particular wine of my choosing. Uh, I will abbreviate it for the sake of the sermon. My Ford was a personal disaster. I do not believe in Ford. Whenever I would get into that car, I really truly would wonder when I put the key in the ignition and went to start it, whether it truly would start. Every time. Like, I had no faith in that car. I did not believe in that car. Because it didn't lead me to a place where I trusted it. On the other hand, uh, unlike Ford, uh, the Toyota that I had, I had the 361st Tercel sold in Canada. It was the most basic of vehicles you could ever want. You could ever want, but when I put the key in, every single time that car started, didn't matter whether it was raining, snowing, hot, cold, didn't matter. And the day that my Tercel died was a sad day indeed in Mascouche, which was where I was living when my Tercel died. It was great, I trusted it, and I believed in it. And I believed, I came to believe because that car would never, never let me down. So to believe is to behave in a certain way based on your experience. You can believe that something's going to be good, you can also believe that something's going to be bad, but you believe in something because of your experience of it, positive or negative. Faith is belief projected into the future, okay? Faith is belief projected into the future. This is not going to happen today, but if I was to go to a bank machine with my bank card because we needed some money to buy some food to bring home for lunch, I believe and I have faith that that will work. I'm hold, I can hold my card here now and look at it, it's just a piece of plastic. But because of my experience of it, I can project that experience into the future and say, if in two hours I was to use it, I have faith it would work. Similarly, <coughs> when I had my Tercel, uh, people got to the point of asking me, you know, how long do you think that thing is going to work? And I would jokingly say, forever. Uh, now, that was faith taken to a foolish degree, <laughs> but my experience led me to be able to project my, my experience of what you're selling into the future. That's what faith is about. So faith is your experience of something projected into the future. Christian faith is your experience of Jesus projected into the future. And if you haven't got an experience of God as he comes to us, as he incarnates in our heart, in our mind, in our soul, in our spirit, you can't have a faith to project in the future. Because faith is about projecting your experience of God into the future. So, it all begins with that experience. And if there is to be any risk taking, if there is to be any daring in Christianity, it will happen when and only when we have enough of an, of an experience of God that we can trust that no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, no matter what mess there may be, no matter what challenge there is, no matter what danger there is, we can be absolutely certain that we will not enter that situation alone. That we will know that God is there with us. Christian daring, or Christian risk, taking risks as a Christian, is preceded by an experience of the trustworthiness of God as we have experienced Him in our lives. Okay? I could continue on that, but the rest of the work I'm going to leave up to you. And the rest of the work is, does that define my experience of God? Does that define my experience of Christianity? I've got to get into the corollary of all of this. I've got to move on to the dare. Otherwise, we'll be in this chilly building far too long. As I said, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the word dare. Um, challenge, to me, seems too tricky. Everybody uses the word challenge. You know, you've got opportunity and you've got challenges. You know, it's, it's a trendy word. Um, risk taking, I'm not happy with that either because risk taking some, uh, can have, can have a, a, a subtlety to it that isn't, isn't what I'm intending here. So frankly, I'm not really sure what word to use to describe what I'm talking about when I say God calls us to step out in faith out of our security zone. Now here I guess this this has got to be a paragraph. Um, sometimes when, when we live our Christianity, um, sometimes, sometimes, it's almost as if we get involved in Christian things and things to do with faith and spirituality as a way of making our world a safer place 
you know, getting things more under control and getting the boundaries set tighter and all the rest of it. We use Christianity as a way of making life safe. Um, you're not going to find that very much in the New Testament. Well, you're not going to find it at all in the New Testament. Uh, what you'll see when you look at the lives of the apostles, the disciples, the followers of Jesus, uh, God, of course, Jesus himself, what you find is that their faith and their commitment to building the kingdom of God took them way outside their comfort zone, uh, took them way outside the realm of the normal for them. And what I'd like to suggest for us is that our discipleship, our discipline in following Jesus, will lead us outside our comfort zone too. In ways that are unique to each of us as individuals, couples, families, church communities, without doubt, it's not a cookie cutter sort of thing, but Jesus will lead us out of our comfort zone. I'd love to go through some of the stories of how the disciples lived their lives and how their lives ended. I'd love to rehearse with you some of the stories of what they did and where they went. Just think of the travels they went on through hostile lands where the risks were really, really high. Think of the voyages they went on, the, 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 the voyages across bodies of water. Uh, and it wasn't safe in those days. Uh, think of what it meant to say that we believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life in a polytheistic culture where the Roman authorities wanted peace at all costs. And sometimes the cost was, they'll kill you to maintain the peace and order as they perceived it. It was not a safe thing to be a Christian. It was a risky thing to be a Christian. And in fact, and I don't want to overplay this, though there's lots of stories here, the Christians used the symbol of a fish as a way of secretly identifying where their meetings were going to take place because it got so risky to be a Christian. And so any domesticated version of Christianity that makes life safe uh, is, is missing at least part of the point. Now please don't hear me wrong. Please don't hear me saying that there is no comfort and security or, or, or any of that in Christianity because there is. But if that's all there is, then I really look at what's going on. Look at some of the things that are needed in the world today. Look at some of what's going on. Um, we've heard recently of a couple of stories of people who have been in prison. Uh, mental illness, yes or no, that's, that's, that's relatively irrelevant. Calling for help. Help does not come, though the calling is acknowledged. And two people, in different circumstances, end up dead. That's a world that we're living in. Terrorism. It's almost, it's almost foolish to, to even introduce that word into a sermon. Uh, because where, where do you go with it? You, know, you just say it. Terrorism in all its forms. Uh, on our shores, overseas. It, what, what can I say? We're in a world in which the armies don't line up anymore and play, play nice like they used to, just killing each other. That's not the world we're living in. We're living in a world that is dangerous in a way it wasn't dangerous 20, 30 years ago. Sexual predators. Are there more? Are there fewer? Are they different? I, I don't have any of the answers to that. But there certainly is some degree of risk there. Uh, financial. Do any of you feel slightly on edge about where you might be financially next year? Do you ever hear about what's going on in Greece and Portugal and, you know, with, with, with the economy of Europe and sort of just cross your fingers and everything you can cross that it doesn't come to Canada? Because you're hearing some really awful stuff about what's going on in the austerity measures over there. We seem to have scraped through. But then the governor of the Bank of Canada gets on the, the TV and says, we forecast for a certain amount of growth. We don't think that's going to happen. And so, good news for those of you that have a mortgage or who want to borrow money, 
the interest rate staying at 1%. Interest rates are staying low. I gotta tell you, as a mortgage payer, I'm kind of glad interest rates are staying low. But when you look at what's that's, what that's saying about the environment, uh, the, the, economics, uh, the economic environment we're in, it's a little bit scary. So, what do Christians do with this? What do Christians do? Well, what I'd like to suggest is, for every headline that we read, or, or for every news story that we hear, in whatever form of media it takes, what Christians need to do is internalize and consciously process that all these headlines translate into an individual or groups of individuals. And that our job as Christians is to reach into the details or the specifics of this and find a way to reach out and to minister. If I can, I, I, I wonder whether I should include this in because it's, it's almost a little bit opportunistic. You know, despite the deep freaks of, of, of the past week, and I don't want to overplay that because we all live in nice home houses, you know, um, but despite the deep freaks of this past week, if you were to walk down St. Catherine Street, you would still see people in their sleeping bags in Montreal. You know, on the street. Why? Why? Like, we are a civilized country. Why are there people sleeping on the streets in Montreal in minus 28, minus 26 temperatures? Why does that happen? Why do we allow it to happen? How come the church isn't screaming about that? Sure, we do, we do have some missions. Uh, we do open up some of the downtown churches when it gets super, super cold. Uh, but I remember a priest by the name of John Lee. Uh, he just turned 80. You know, he taught me, well, he taught me a bunch of stuff. And one of the things that I remember John would say again and again and again, he was very much a social justice advocate, uh, when, when, when he was teaching us as, as seminarians a long time ago. And what John would say is, you know, ministry to the immediate need is important and good, but you've got to look at the, the systemic reason why that need exists. And you've got to deal with the systemic stuff as well. Christians need to deal not only with the immediate need, but with the systemic problem that causes that need. Why are there people in Canada sleeping on the street. And don't tell me it's because they're choosing to. I have, believe it or not, heard that. There's a lot about bullying in, in, in the media. Uh, it is trendy to talk about bullying. Bullying's an awful thing. You know, a lot of us were bullied. I certainly was bullied when I was going through school, and it's become trendy. And the horrible thing that happened with Amanda Todd, and I don't think bullying's been become trendy, the talk about it's become trendy, the horrible thing that happened with Amanda Todd has sort of raised the temperature on discussions about bullying. Why is it tolerated? Why do we allow it to be reduced to, let's provide another course or another seminar. If you've, you've done our job, now we can move on. How do we tolerate that sort of behavior in our society? Sorry to say, we do. We do. Canada is a land of incredible opportunity and incredible prosperity. Do you know that there are people hungry in Canada? Do you know that there and, and not just native people up, up, up there, First Nations, uh, in our cities. Malnutrition is an in, is an issue in Montreal for children. A, a, a principal of a local school a few years ago was saying how she can tell what kids come to school hungry. This is a school in vegan school. She can tell what kids come to school hungry because they just start to fade around recess time in the middle of the day. And they need to provide breakfasts because these kids don't, whatever's going on in their home, they don't have the nutrition they need. Oh, that's ridiculous. Vegan school? Come on. Everybody in vegan school has a huge house in Mercedes. Uh, well, maybe some people do have big houses, maybe they even have a Mercedes and no food in the country because they can't pay for it. Uh, and the list goes on. Okay. 
I can be anecdotal to the past moment, but you know this. You know this. Christians are called to step into it. Christians are called to step in and make some noise, to make a mess, and to intervene, and to change things. Christians are called to step into the dirt of society and the messes that we make in society and say, this is not what God wants. And to say with God's authority what God does indeed want. And what he wants is that every individual be recognized as a unique, valued soul. That every person on this planet is my brother and my sister. And I have responsibility for them. And that I am accountable to God and to them for how I spend my time and how I spend my money and how I share the resources that I have been given. A little while ago, I was, uh, any of you look at Wimp, you know, those little short video things, it's wimp.com. Some of them are really good. I was looking at one uh, that, I, that was just absolutely fascinating to me. Uh, and I'm not going to get this as right as I should because I, I just don't have the knowledge. But um, this was about um, a, 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 an intergalactic journey um, and through the universe. And not the whole universe, but 400,000 of the nearest galaxies. You know? Uh, isn't that weird? This thing, it obviously, it was a, a rendition, a rendition, but they know that there's over 400,000 galaxies, etc., etc. And it's like you were in a spacecraft going obviously way faster than the speed of light, going around and looking at all these 400,000 galaxies. This is galaxies, not planets, I'm not misspeaking. 400,000 galaxies made up of, as Carl was saying, never did it, it's a billions, billions of stars, okay? I don't know how much life there is out there. You know, none of us do, God does. But let's say, in all those hundreds of thousands of galaxies, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of millions of planets. And on maybe, I don't know how many hundred million planets, there's people, there's, there's, there's life. No matter how long those 400 galaxies have existed or will exist, and no matter how many more hundreds of thousands or millions of galaxies and planets and stars are discovered, there will never, ever, 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 ever be anyone born as unique as you or you or you. Or you. We are absolutely unique in the order of creation. We are unique under God. And that goes for every man, woman, child, and child on this planet. And as such, under God, we have an obligation as Christians to not only give an intellectual affirmation to that uniqueness and that specialness of each of God's creation, but to care for it according to its needs, not our convenience. Can I say that again? Because frankly, I think it's the one good line in my sermon. We have an obligation to care for God's humanity according to humanity's needs, not according to our convenience. That means fork over some of your cash. And I am not talking good about it. It means Fork over some of your time. Does it strike you as weird that as we are gathered here this morning and as we live our lives over the next week, there are people about five minutes drive here, some of them very elderly, who have no one left living, who one would call the people they would have fellowship with. And they're lonely. And they're lonely today. And they're lonely tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after, and the day after. And occasionally, they're put on a bus and taken to Fairview. Occasionally, they're taken out to eat or to a movie. Occasionally, somebody comes in to entertain them and all the rest of it. And the place that they're living is doing their best to take care of their needs. And some of that involves companionship. They're lonely. They're lonely. And they're not far from here. If what I said, about under God and the uniqueness of each individual, taking people with care of people according to their needs, not our convenience. If you believe that, then 
a little bit of your time, maybe, should be devoted to caring by visiting. And you know, obviously, your brains are, are, are fast, and you're going ahead of them, and you're thinking of the hungry, and you're thinking of the street people, and you're thinking of people at St. Michael's Mission, and Milan Mission, and Lodge Fem, and West Island Women's Shelter, and the hospitals, and you're, you're, you're thinking about stuff, and you're probably thinking further, you're thinking about 85 million refugees in the world, and you're thinking of, I don't know more, and what that's all about, and you're thinking about, thinking about, thinking about. Well, God doesn't call us to do what we can't do. And what we can't do is take care of all the world's situations on our own. But what we can do as individuals and as a collective is recognize the uniqueness of each individual and minister to that according to our abilities based on their need rather than our convenience. And I will absolutely promise and guarantee you that if you choose to live that kind of life, you will find yourself sometimes in some pretty risky positions. And just occasionally, as you step into that situation, you'll ask yourself the question, do I dare do this? Whatever that this is. And under God, the answer will be yes. Now let's pray. Amen. God, we see your, or Jesus, we see your example in reaching out to the poor, the marginalized, the victims of society in the time that you lived in. We see you embracing the outcasts, the dirty, the smelly, the broken, the wounded. We see you breaking all sorts of social conventions and taboos for the sake of your love, of humanity. Pray that you strengthen in us the will to serve as you serve and continue to serve. Strengthen in us the will to risk, to dare to be different, to dare to do the things that need to be done, to reach out to the poor and marginalized in our community and abroad. Thank you that we do have the freedom in this country and the resources to make an incredible difference in the lives of some. Open our hearts and open our eyes to see the needs as you present them to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.